I finally took five pages, so it should be easy on you. I, I didn't do any research because I am. The truth about the AT&T girl? What, that she's hot? Yeah, I knew that. <laughs> Dude, how much porn are you watching on that computer right now? Welcome back to another episode of the show. We are your hosts, Colin Peters. Snakes. Why do they have to be snakes? That's all I can say. You gotta start it out like that. Fucking whooping out your snakes already. Snakes? Snakes, snakes. I don't know no snakes. <laughs> I don't know no snakes. <laughs> they already did that. <laughs> we actually have a show here for you guys that was probably two years in the making, I'd say. I mean, we first talked about this when we first started doing the podcast, and it's a movie that we all love, and it's a highly loved classic from everybody. I have actually heard people say they some don't like it, but I mean, different strokes. Yeah, I know, John. I I was surprised too. It was blasphemy. <laughs> That's how I felt. But we are doing uh, Steven Spielberg and Harrison Ford's, or should I say, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg's Raiders of the Lost Ark, which was later on titled. Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Indeed. This top five of all time movies. I mean, when this movie comes on, no matter if it's on television or on Voodoo or Blu-ray, the cell phone is off, my eyes are front, and my mouth is shut because this movie is that damn good. I can't say enough positive things about this movie. Oh, this movie is absolutely fantastic. I, I'll be honest with you guys. I actually saw... Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom first, which is the second one in the sequence, but chronologically, Temple of Doom actually takes place a year prior to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right, I think the time period is 1933, I think, with uh, Temple of Doom. I could be wrong, but it definitely does I think it was first. at least a year before Raiders, from what I remember. Be yes, be uh, it goes Temple, and then it goes Raiders, and then it goes Last Crusade. Yeah, but I just mean, like, as far as the actual year goes mm -hmm. i think it's just a year separate from i think that's all it is yeah from what they are mm -hmm. i i actually saw temple of doom first like i said and i enjoyed that a lot i didn't do nothing about indiana jones i think we got it because i don't know if you guys remember this but every now and then burger king would sometimes depending on what kind of meals you got would give you vhs movies and one of them was Temple of Doom. Are you that, I, I believe that's how we got it. it was either it was that. either through that or it was a Christmas present. But yeah, there's some nostalgia throwback. That's that's right, right, or Pizza Hut. They were doing movies for a while too. That's right. That's they right. Were. They did do that. I remember that. Oh, uh, I'd say honestly, the first time I was introduced to Indiana Jones was the third one with uh, Sean Connery. Same here. Nice. That's how I first saw Indiana Jones was <laughs> Last Crusade. Yeah, and honestly, the one scene that stuck out the most with that one was the scene with the birds when he kept opening and closing the umbrella. I was like, well, and then I think it was my dad was like, this is a third one in the series. I go, wait, there's more? Yeah. <laughs> I suddenly remembered my Charlemagne. <laughs> well, it's, you know, now because, like I said, that the sequence was Temple of Doom first for me, the second movie I did see was Raiders then. And, I mean, there was some things that, like, I think the big one that we'll explain is the gun scene that the the famous gun scene mm -hmm. he actually tries to recreate that in temple and when you see it it doesn't make any sense because you don't realize the nostalgia behind it but it does it still is a funny moment like oh he just thought he was missing it but the significance is what came in raiders with. now i gotta do what i was supposed to do in raiders and actually fight these guys exactly. with, the sword, with my bare hands because that most iconic scene with him at the um this is the scene where he's in Cairo, Egypt, <laughs> the face-to-face -face encounter with the swordsman, shoots him with a gun when he was originally supposed to fight him with a sword. <laughs> yeah, there's more to that. There's a lot more to that. But I remember catching on uh, Raiders when uh, going to the grocery store because they used to have little rental sections for tapes 
at that time. Like, if you couldn't go to a Blockbuster, your local grocery store or gas station had <laughs> rentals. And I remember seeing the cover of Raiders of the Lost Ark and noticing that it was Indiana Jones on it. And I thought, well, hey, this looks like Indiana Jones and looks like another one. Like, that's kind of like how I stumbled on it, Jeff. Mm-hmm. Was I was like, okay, cool. There's, a, there's more of these. Turns there's out a- it's the one that started it all. Yeah, I know. <laughs> And then it was on TV, and I, I watched it. And I found it really interesting because it's it's a lot of fun. These movies are so much fun. And there was a documentary on Amazon Prime, I think, called In Search of the Last Action Hero. And I believe they, I don't want to say claim, but said that Raiders of the Lost Ark was kind of like the first of an action movie series. Like mm-hmm. There really wasn't a series at that time. And Raiders was, what, 1980, 81, I think, when it came out. I think it was started filming 1980, and then it came out in 81. I could be wrong, but um, I'm going to say 1980. Okay, because I remember Harrison Ford said he just finished um, Empire, and he took about three months off and really wasn't getting any sort of movies that interested him. And then when he got the call from Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, he said, well, this actually really interests me. And There's a lot about that because he was not the original choice. No, he wasn't. He wasn't even cast to be the first no, choice. No, no, no. I, I, I did a lot of history about that um, in terms of the character. We'll get to that. But um, the original choice or one person that actually did screen test was a guy named Nick Mancuso, who was a Canadian actor who has a very similar build to Harrison Ford. Um, the only movies that I really know that he was in were Under Siege 1 and 2, a.k.a. Cock Puncher 1 and 2. <laughs> That's really all I really know him from, but I can see why they gravitated towards him with this mustache and this similar build, but Tom Selleck did a lot of screen tests for the role of Indiana Jones. Yes, Magnum P.I. and Blue Bloods, Tom Selleck. And he got casted then. He did. They liked him. They liked him. He did a successful screen test, but there's a problem. He was still under a binding contract with Magnum P.I. that would prevent him from doing the film schedule for Raiders, so he had to drop out. So George Lucas and Steven Spielberg are saying, we've only got a few weeks until filming begins. What do we do? Oh, remember that guy Harrison Ford who did Star Wars with us? Should we bring him on? Should we bring him on? And George Lucas wasn't too crazy about it. (laughs) Well, at first, he wasn't too crazy because he didn't want it to be a Robert De Niro and using a constant guy over and over again and having a signature actor. And I had heard that, I think even when he used him in, what was it, American Graffiti? He wasn't too crazy about using him in Star Wars then, but he hired him to be a script reader when they were doing auditions, mm-hmm. and he was better than the Han Solos that were <laughs> like reading off. And they said, well, we might as well just use Harrison Ford to be the the Han Solo character. So I mean, it, are, there's this funny like like way yeah. of getting hired between yeah. him and George Luke. <laughs> He's our Swiss Army man. He's a script doctor. He's a carpenter for us. And let's just have him be Han Solo. <laughs> I feel like it's that meme, like, fuck you, I'll see you tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) That's Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford. Honestly, I don't see anybody else playing Indy besides Harrison Ford. Like, yeah, they tried to hand it off to Shia LaBeouf in 4, which I don't ever want to see. This is a movie that shall not be named. (laughs) Why don't we just just leave it at that? Because that could be an entirely whole episode itself. As of yesterday, I found out they are doing a video game. They're trying to get Harrison Ford on board to do the voice, at least. But uh, from what I was reading, too, there's also... He's contracted to do two more movies through Disney. Two more? Yeah. Wow. So I'm, mm. ge- so I'm hoping, maybe with Disney at the helm, they might actually do something cool with it. But we'll see. We'll see. I heard... The last I heard about that was Steven Spielberg did drop out of directing. Oh, yes. And it was James Mangold was is now currently attached to directing it. The guy who did 4V Ferrari as well as 310 to Yuma. A talented director. Did he a do very, Logan? He did Logan. Oh. A very under-the-radar director, but he's incredibly talented at what he can do. So, yeah, that's a good choice. The uh, thing about... Oh, sorry. Go I was ahead. Saying, honestly, I was just more excited about the game because, like, he's old. I'm like, I get it. He still needs to play the character, finish it off, be done. Mm-hmm. But in a different medium... I, it might be more fun, like how uh, Bruce Campbell's doing Ash. It's, so it's like, yeah, they're older gentlemen, mm-hmm. but they can still play their character in another form. I feel like we're you, due for a good video game with Indiana Jones. I agree. I, I think it's kind of like uh, the Ghostbusters game. Yes. I mean, I thought that was the coolest thing. And what was really cool about that game was you got to play as a character that really didn't have a face. No. And, so, <laughs> and, you, were with, and you were with the guys. So it was kind of like... 
you were a Ghostbuster with Harold Ramis, Dan Aykroyd, Ernie Hudson, and Bill Murray. That was so much fun. Yeah, I agree. Oh, so I, I welcome an Indiana Jones game. That'd be so awesome because then you get to imagine like what the cool stuff you could do with the whip. Mm-hmm. That'd be Go wild. Swinging from one set piece to another. I mean, they could have recreations of those three movies and then introduce new levels of different adventures, different artifacts, different myths and things like that. That'd be really awesome. They could technically just do the original temple and radar radars. Raiders as like the tutorial and like you that's where I think you would get the most training because a lot of stuff happens in just that opening sequence. Mm-hmm. So Oh yeah. And that can introduce like everything you need to do to get to I can see stuff. that. Nineteen thirty six South America and the Amazon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they could probably come up with some really cool archaeological findings or little history things that we didn't know that could lead to some interesting history to come by Mm -hmm. i think that would be really wild because i i find archaeology archaeology really fascinating so there's a lot of really cool stuff with indiana jones i think the archaeological uh, findings are really cool i know i'm struggling with that art art. yeah (laughs) i'm I'm not even gonna try it but yeah Uh, there's that john williams came back and did the music which is absolutely fantastic i mean you know that it's indiana jones when you hear the i'm not gonna lie there was was one sequence where you could tell he reused something from star wars oh yeah because i'm sitting there as i'm watching it and i'm like yo this sound it's harrison ford at the bar and after you know i'm not gonna get that i'll get into this you can actually hear the same tone that he used for uh, one of the same similar sequences in star wars i'm like Ah, yeah. good that makes sense because I'm actually picking it up right now. Yeah, is this this is right after the truck exploded and he yeah. thinks that Marion is dead. Everybody knows this movie. Listen, yeah. you, come on, the spoiler out there. This is a stop. forty plus year old movie. Everybody <laughs> hey, has just seen because this movie. it's forty years old doesn't mean everybody has seen it. Yeah, man. I'm gonna I mean, smack somebody. <laughs> <laughs> there are Star Wars correlations besides the fact that you got. John Williams, Harrison Ford, Steven Spielberg. Well, Steven Spielberg didn't really do anything with Star Wars directly that I know of. Lawrence Kasdan, the screenwriter. Yeah, but George Lucas uh, specifically. But I believe it was in uh, one of the temples. There's a hieroglyph that's actually C-3PO and R2-D2. I tried looking for it. I could Um, not see it for the life of me. You may not be able to. Where they actually find the ark. It's actually all in the pillars. I I, I kept looking at the damn pillars. They said... When they go into the Ark chamber, when they're about to lift the stone off of the tomb, and then they poise the Ark, I'm like looking everywhere for this damn hieroglyph, and I can't find it. So it's pretty well hidden. And I don't know yeah, if I like, you saw gotta, a YouTube video where they circle it like, hey, here it is, right there, we found it. <laughs> they would have to, because like, that sequence is kind of like that before they actually like are pulling mm-hmm. everything apart. But it's such a fun movie in general. I mean, the whole franchise, m- minus Crystal Skull... <laughs> It's pretty fun. You named it. <laughs> I did. I not really need to watch for no reason at all. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. I saw it in theaters and... Up top. <laughs> I was like, what are we? Hey, we watched together. together. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Yo, wasn't it Hulk in the net or that yep. and Hulk? Yeah, in the same day. <laughs> the same. Yeah, we literally like went back to the box office and we're like, oh yeah, we want another movie ticket for <laughs> I had the same reaction after I saw Phantom Menace. It was okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. We made up for it later on when we saw that Raiders came to IMAX and we're like, oh, damn. See, that was the first movie that I ever saw, an old classic on the big screen. When we saw it in 2013, Raiders was coming back to theaters. I said to myself, this is a thing? Theaters are doing this? Bring old classics to the IMAX screen, the big screen? Fuck yeah. Sign me up. That was wild. (laughs) It was great. That was the first old classic I saw in, in a major motion picture screen. Hmm. Incredible. But going back to this character, I'm always wondering, how did they come up with such an awesome character? How did they find out the inspiration for Indiana Jones? There was they, a combination of things. Yes, but I did a little history, and as I do, I love history. Obviously, you're looking at another fucking book over there. It's five pages, Jeff. It's not 40 like it was for the New Year video. (laughs) Get your facts right. (laughs) But, you know, I would even go as far as to say, a lot of people uh, said there was a lot of inspirational characters, but I would even go as far as the early 1900s with a guy named Lawrence of Arabia. Thomas Edward, Thomas Andrew, uh, Edward Lawrence, Thomas Edward, oh my God, Thomas Edward Lawrence, who is a student of architecture, archaeology, who went to Jesus College, Cambridge, 
He spoke six languages. He was a British liaison officer. He was physically fit. And at this time, during World War I, he helped an Arab army unite with one another to combat against the Ottoman Empire and turn the tide of World War I for the Allied powers, and basically brought an empire that lasted half a millennia to its knees. He orchestrated a guerrilla tactical force to get what he wanted to do, and it's incredible. And from that moment on, a larger-than-life figure who really existed, and then there was another guy who comes years around the road called Roy Chapman Andrews. And there's a lot of articles about him. There's a really fascinating one about him in the Smithsonian where he was the real-life Indiana Jones. And he, get this, he was from Wisconsin. All right. He's a guy from Wisconsin, and his dream was to one day work at the Natural Museum of History. He wanted to work there so bad, where the whole thing would be like, that belongs in a museum. That could have easily come from him. He always wanted to work at this museum. He loved the ambition so much that he bought a ticket just to go there to apply for a job. He was denied, but he worked his way through the ranks, starting out as a janitor, and through the years, he eventually worked up the ladder until they just said, all right, let's give you some field work. So they sent him out overseas to do some archeological digs and some supervision on certain sites. The stories that this guy had, the perils that he encountered, it's crazy. Like, he recalls he and his wife almost being eaten by wild dogs, surviving typhoons, a python attack, and also surviving two muggings from bandits over in the Middle East. And this is a guy that, when he would go overseas, he had a gun with him. He'd be on horseback, he'd be on camel, and he always armed himself with a pistol or a rifle. And he discovered a lot of key things, a lot of the big things. One big thing was he discovered fossilized dinosaur eggs in the Gobi Desert in China. Probably the one thing that he was mostly known for finding. But doesn't this all sound familiar? Surviving python attacks, inclement weather, fanatical priests. Yeah, he survived an attack from fanatical priests overseas. Wow. Temple of Doom? <laughs> <laughs> Even though Steven Spielberg and George Lucas didn't flat out say, yeah, he was inspired by Roy Chapman Andrews. They didn't come out and directly say it. He inspired the character. <laughs> yeah, I never really heard who directly inspired the character. I just know that George Lucas actually was inspired by the old Saturday morning serials, I believe, that you right. went to the movies for. And they mm -hmm. had the big, heavy action heroes that would pit themselves up against these like no-win situations. And it was, oh, come back next Saturday or something. And right. they wanted, he wanted to do something like that. And I guess... He actually was going to do Indiana Jones before Star Wars, but it kept on getting pushed off to the side. Mm -hmm. And then by the time he was ready to do it, he just didn't feel like being the director behind it. And he was talking to Steven Spielberg, and he said that he actually wanted... Spielberg, I mean, wanted to do a James Bond movie, and I guess was actually denied. Which, there's actually a really cool tribute that Steven Spielberg does, but it's in Temple of Doom. And if we talk about Temple of Doom, I'll save it for that. Mm -hmm. And it's a, like a James Bond tribute, actually. Never mind Sean Connery being in Last Crusade. Oh. But <laughs> Missed opportunity. Yeah. On <laughs> but that was what got Steven Spielberg's attention because George Lucas said, well, here, I have this idea. It's kind of James Bond-esque in a way. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is what I'm thinking of, is that it's I want it to be fun. I want it to be serious, but let the audience have a good time. You know, don't take it too seriously, but let it let the drama and the, you know have comical moments. And and it's true, there is this like well balanced where it's to the verge where some things could be campy, but it's not there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, they they just did such a brilliant job with that. Yeah. And that's where this creation of that character came from. And I think the idea of the the leather jacket and the the whip and the hat and the, the satchel and stuff was all like pre-planned too. I think so. Yeah. Satchel. <laughs> satchel. Yeah. Not a person. It's a satchel. <laughs> no, but, that's really what yeah. it is. It's a yeah. satchel. <laughs> yeah, it is a satchel. And you mentioned James Bond. Now there was one scene or one character that was omitted that could have made it seem like they were going in a James Bond direction. And that's when Marcus Brody goes to visit Harrison Ford uh, at his house, saying, "The military, they want you to go after the Ark." And you can see that Indiana Jones is dressed in a robe with an undershirt. 
there was supposed to be a woman in that house. So, yeah, he was seeing somebody, but they omitted that character saying, well, we don't really want to go that James Bond route where he's this playboy. We want to undersell that. That would be awkward, especially because they're talking about Marion in that scene. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I'm not marrying this scene. Either way. <laughs> but not to mention, like, he's also oblivious to the idea that women fawn over him, especially the classroom scene where he's this handsome guy and he's got all these women just fawning over him and the girl has the message on her eyelids, love you, and he's squinting like, oh, I had no idea. Where was I? <laughs> Well, anyway, back to this temple I just ran out of. <laughs> yeah, um, back to the lesson. Um, read chapters three and four, and I'll see you next time. <laughs> I'm kind of glad they omitted that, because like you said, yeah, they mentioned Marion. She's she's kind of a big deal yeah. in this movie. They had a <laughs> thing. <laughs> they had a thing ten yeah. years ago that had a falling out with a professor of his in Abner Ravenwood. <laughs> Which Not is her dad. Her dad. They were on good speaking terms for a while because of Marion. <laughs> and then she owned a bar. <laughs> In Nepal. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my god. And every these main characters get some awesome introductions. You have Indiana Jones getting introduced in the Amazon rainforest, surviving a gun attack where he uses the whip and disarms the guy and he goes fleeing before he gets pelted with arrows in his back. You have Marion, who's out drinking somebody on the opposite end of a table with shot after shot after shot. It's incredible. Yeah, and the fact that right after that, she gets into a fight scene, and I'm like, yo, did the alcohol even affect her? <laughs> no, no, she can handle her liquor. And the fact that she just slugs him after seeing him walk through her door. And she's a petite thing, you know, yeah. for her to handle her liquor like that. I was like, yo, you go. So that kind of lets you know that and it's true, Marion wasn't a damsel in distress either. I mean, no. she had those distressful moments, but she could fight when she had to. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was really fun to watch, too. That was a little bit of the... Uh, uh, came after Alien, but it was kind of like another femme fatale that was able to kick ass and not be frightened. I mean, she was scared, but it wasn't like, oh my god, I can't defend myself at all. Right. No, she could defend herself. Yeah. And she was very smart. She knew uh, her studies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fuck archaeology. I can't say that right now. <laughs> one time you say it fine. Like, yeah. like, fuck it. <laughs> oh, Give me a man. quarter. I got it right. <laughs> oh, Karen Allen. She's gorgeous. Oh, my God. She was just... That smile that she has in that movie is just... Oh, it's something. <laughs> but here's the funny thing. Uh, as we are watching it, Lexi was saying that apparently everyone took that sentence she said too literal, where... Um, she's like, you took advantage of me, I was only a child. My brain's going, they're the same fucking age. So even ten years ago, when he took advantage of her, I'm like, so you might be two years apart? I get it, he, you're more naive at that point than he was, but still, you guys take it that literal? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was a different time frame. Where... Saying. It's I'm an, just saying. Like, it's an awkward situation. Yeah, yeah. and it was just weird because Lexi said that and opened my eyes and like, that actually made me one thing that made me mad. I'm like, are you fucking serious, people? You can't leave this fucking movie alone? <laughs> <laughs> I, I plead the fifth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> your, your brain's now trying to figure that out, too. It's just like... <laughs> That's it. Oh, okay. Here come the Nazis and the uh, <laughs> yeah. policemen. Okay, let's let's get a bar brawl going on here. Let's get the place on fire. <laughs> yeah, the Nazis are the main antagonists in this. Uh... Listen, the Nazis could be the main antagonists in every fucking movie. Yeah, really. For no, for no reason at all. <laughs> no be like, really oh, can. by the way, the Nazis were part of it the whole time. <laughs> yeah. And I gotta admit, at first I, I I was really young when I first saw Raiders, and there's a lot to go on. Like I didn't really know much about Nazis and World War II, but I also was confused because uh, what's his name? Who plays Belloc? Paul Freeman. Paul Freeman. Thank you. He at first shows up at the very beginning of the movie after Indiana goes through all that bullshit with getting the idol and the boulder, and Alfred Molina is the guy with him that bet basically like <laughs> ran away Fuck and took you, him <laughs> exactly <gets> him <laughs> on spikes <laughs> and and um and paul freeman is rivalry mm -hmm. you know he's pretty much the same thing as indiana jones another archaeologist who is from what i take is that he's kind of like two steps ahead of indiana but he cheats his way there all the time 
just like how he cheated this way again. Like Indiana does all the work, and it's like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. By, by the way, fuck you. Thank you. <laughs> it also adds another element because he's a French archaeologist, and France was part of the Allied powers. So the fact that the Axis powers, the German power, recruited him because I guess he has no faith to his country because it's all about money. Yeah. It's all about greed and something else and power. And then when they discover the power of the Ark, I mean, that would let, let anybody just question their commitment. Okay. Because so, that's because nobody talks about the Ark of the Covenant, for one. I no. mean, even in movies and really in history, I noticed that they don't talk about the Ark of the Covenant at all. Like, I remember I had to really do some digging on my own to be like, so what's the significance about this? And it was, oh, well, that's where the Ten Commandment stones were, were placed. And I thought, oh. This is something, like what we said in the previous episode, the Old Testament real wrath of God type shit coming back. Because whenever I heard the Ark growing up, all I thought of was Noah. Yeah. Noah's Ark, yes. <laughs> so when I heard about the, the Lost Ark of the Covenant, I'm thinking, well, what is this Lost Ark of the Covenant? And it was Indiana Jones that introduced that. It was so fascinating. In like the first 20 minutes, you get that entire story about the historical context, and you see the image of the Hebrews carrying the Ark and the power of God coming out of it, basically killing everybody around him. We ever looked at him. I remember that disturbed me as a kid mm-hmm. because no, because it was that that biblical looking old school illustration in there, and like you said, it's that real. It puts the fear of God into you, and then yeah. the John Williams music that's playing with it, just oh my it's, god, it's it, eerie. It, it, it's it makes chilling. you feel that uncomfortable feeling. It just captured a a really like. This is serious shit here. <laughs> <laughs> what did moment. Sunday school become so fascinating? <laughs> it was before Sunday cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, as Marcus Brody says, whoever controls the Ark, the army, is invincible. And so, that's why Hitler wanted it. And that's true. Hitler was a fanatical in terms of finding artifacts across the country. He did send out teams to find things like this. That's true. <laughs> So, and th- another thing that we got to point out is throughout the whole movie of Raiders of the Lost Ark, you don't see Hitler. No. No. It's just his regime. Mm-hmm. And you really don't hear any mention of Hitler that much. Like, maybe once or twice, I know... The in- Fuhrer. They were first. Yeah, I was going to say, I, know, I remember Indiana Jones mentions it to Belloc at one point. And he's in like, a very sarcastic tone, yeah. too. Like, mm-hmm. The Fuhrer. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he's already, like, three sheets to the wind at that point. Like, fuck it. <laughs> so yeah, he's ready to fight him in front of the whole bar. <laughs> but, like, any of these people, these archaeological teams, is like, okay, he can have it when I'm done with it. Because you realize that you're sending me out to find something, but I realize, well, this has a lot of significant power. I want that power for myself. You can have the second round of that power. Or maybe not at all. <laughs> Maybe I'll undermine you, Adolf Hitler, if Belloc got the control of the Ark and realized, oh shit, this is what this can do? He ain't touching it. It's all mine. It's, it's, it's just such fascinating. fascinating. Um, the entire scope of this movie, feeling so grand, the cinematography, they didn't film in Cairo, they filmed in Tunisia, so they got the locations to be similar to what it was like in, um, in that time period. Oh, that's they, another Star Wars correlation. They said they filmed a lot of those scenes... Uh, like in the first movie where the desert scenes were... Tatooine. Yep. Yep, in Tunisia. And the reason why they used Tunisia was because they said they didn't need to see pyramids and uh, the Sphinx and all the other things. So the location uh, guy, <laughs> the scout. This is the scout. The uh, he, he, he was like, so, so are we going to see any of this here? And they said no. And he goes, okay, so we don't really have to go to Egypt then. Yeah. If they already have something set up, why not use it? Already use it. I think it was also a troubled location at that time where they didn't feel maybe particularly safe if they had to film oh, that's in Cairo. Very possible. They probably didn't want to go anywhere near there because of maybe what was going on at the time frame. And they thought, let's go somewhere a little safer that can still get the gist of what people are seeing on camera. So let's go to another location that looks like Egypt but isn't Egypt. And that happens all the time. In oh, films. yeah, constantly. And there were some troubles there. There was um, extreme heat, some python biting going on, and some uh, food poisoning. Except Spielberg, because he ate Kansas SpaghettiOs. 
Wait. He avoided getting food poisoning. <laughs> I guess it's smart, not knowing what you're gonna get. Might as well get some of this prepackaged. <laughs> exactly. Get a some lot of those canned goods. Yeah. I mean, a lot of those people are probably just so preconditioned to the dirty environment there that a lot of the food's not really sanitized like we have here, and they probably don't use like all the additives and preservatives that they use either. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what kind of stuff. Ugh. Sometimes I wonder what's worse, like organic bacteria or additives and preservatives. <laughs> That's a whole other discussion. A double-edged <laughs> sword. <laughs> so after they decide that they're going to go after, well, Indiana Jones is going to go after the Ark, and he wants to re connect with Marion again, which is what leads him to finding her at the bar. And like Well, he, technically, they he needed something that she has. Yes. Ah, yeah. So like it, well, double edged sword. He need to reconnect with her because her father knew of something that he needs. So And he's not aware that he's she, dead. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Well, it's been a communique issue that the Nazis have discovered this city of Tannis which is supposedly where the last resting place of the Ark of the Covenant is. The Germans discovered it, but they don't know exactly where it is. So there's a MacGuffin, the Ark, and then there's also another need, and that's the staff, the Staff of Ra, and that's the headpiece that you were referring to, Jeff. So they need two parts to this, and Marion's got one of them. And it's this, cert, this well, that, that leads to the map room and everything, but... I, w I just want to go quickly go back to that that bar brawl scene. Um, the the Sherpa, that guy has the pleasure of dying twice in this movie. I don't know if you uh, recognize him a little closely. The big hulking guy that's basically given Indiana Jones the business. He's also the big hulking German who gets cut to pieces by the plane propeller. So wait, he gives Harrison Ford the business twice. Yeah, <laughs> I think yeah. he's in every Indiana Jones movie too. I think he, he's he's also in Temple of Doom. Yes, <laughs> giving Indiana Jones the business. This, this <laughs> yeah. guy is literally <laughs> trying to fucking enter Jones. <laughs> I think he's in the third. I think he's in Last Crusade, but he's not uh, an adversary. I think he's just another character in the foreground. <laughs> I just had him like, yo, you were in the other two. Uh, come on. <laughs> just, yeah, just, yeah, just, just right here. Be in this movie, please, for us. You, you've done some great work for us. Please be in the movie. <laughs> but those gun sound effects, they are so iconic because you, you hear gun sound effects in movies constantly. They all sound the same. They are so distinct in this movie from the revolver shots, the machine gun firing. Everything is so distinct in this movie. Even the Wilhelm scream. <laughs> I'm glad it was brought back. <laughs> Has to be. It's a Spielberg production. <laughs> but this is a PG-rated movie, and there is blood everywhere in this film. God damn, they got some balls <laughs> for a 1980s movie. That's some great bloody violence right there. If you really think about it, there wasn't like anything crazy up to that point. Like, Yeah, they got shot, they showed a little bit of blood, mm -hmm. but it's still considered PG because there wasn't much swearing. They say maybe shit and hell. So, I mean, yeah. And, and I, I believe they reference. I, I don't remember it, but if they referenced hell, it would actually be hell as itself. It wouldn't be, what the hell, man? Yeah. yeah okay. Hell is the place. Yeah. yeah. But I could see why they got a PG rating because, like, yeah, it's a lot of shooting, but there's not, like, a crazy amount of blood. Like, there's a little bit. There's a body count. <laughs> yeah. But that's all it takes. <laughs> like, come on. Think about um, all the Marvel movies. There is a body count. But they don't. Oh yeah, but there's no like bloody shit. Like one guy getting <laughs> shot in the back of the head, yeah. or one guy getting shot through the chest, or how about that finale? <laughs> there's also a logical reason for that, because no. PG-13 didn't exist until <laughs> Temple of Doom. Well, because of Temple of Doom, they said we need to do a PG-13 rating because we we've already pushed the boundaries. I think it was Red Dawn that was the first movie that actually garnered the PG-13 rating. Yeah, so that was a movie that made history, but it was because of, of Temple of Doom. Okay, this shit's really violent. We we got we gotta we gotta do something about this. Which kind of <laughs> cracks me up because it's mainly the one scene in Temple of Doom that really made him go, "Oh man, we gotta change well, that." But at the at the very end of Raiders, I, well, we'll get to it. But I, I just want to say, like, so that's okay. <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> Nobody stopped to question the rating at the very end when the Nazis get it. <laughs> Fuck them, they're Nazis. They got yeah, I guess first. that's what it was. <laughs> like, yeah. No, there weren't any Nazis in Temple of Doom. So. No, there were not. But there was also, you know, not just like heart ripping, but children's slavery and other dark themes in that movie. Wow, you can wreck two movies in yeah, one Yeah, John, the guess. fuck, man? Yeah. Get the hell out you of here. sit in the corner. No, <laughs> you go sit in the corner. RDM, what's the point? <sighs> Where's the dunce cap? Where's the straight jacket? God damn We're it. We're talking about raiders here. You don't have to get into detail about Temple of Doom yet. You can do a whole Temple of Doom episode. Well, then we should. Oh. I hate you right now. <laughs> Well, why the fuck should anybody listen to it now? Is <laughs> John's well. just giving it away. You gotta be fucking kidding me. You gotta, get the, the hell out of here. Get your dick out and run it on the table next time. It'll probably be more enjoyable. <laughs> I know, you turn you on, Jeff. Watching you get a splinter? Absolutely. <laughs> Back to the arc. Wow, man. All right. So, bar fight. That. All right, cool. I, I totally lost train of thought after, you know, screaming at John for wrecking two movies instead of one. Wrecking <laughs> two movies, my ass. Anyway, um, do you notice how, um, it may not be familiar to you guys, but that location where they filmed The Well of Souls just so happened to be the Overlook Hotel for The Shining. Was it? Just like the f- frame? The frame. The framework. Yeah, they actually filmed that scene where the Overlook Hotel was filmed in The Shining. It's kind of funny how these things just kind of come together. You know, that, it's just, wait, that was Pinewood Studios? That was Pinewood okay. Studios, yeah. yeah. That makes sense, because that's where they filmed a lot of Star Wars, too. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. once again, George Lucas, you're really not stretching far with anything. Kind of hard to find that location out in Tunisia. Just a little bit. <laughs> you know, I forget about how the whole editing thing. I'm just like, oh, yeah, they're looking to a hole in the ground. Good job there, Indy. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the snakes. Turns out some of those snakes weren't actually snakes. They were legless lizards. Try saying that five times real fast. Legless, legless lizards, lizards. Legless lizards. <laughs> legless lizards. Legless lizards. Because if you look a little closely, they have some distinct ear holes, too. But there were some devenomized cobras in that pit. I know one snake wrangler did get latched on by a python. And even though it wasn't venomous, he still had a distinct mark on his hand. Oh, man. And yeah, apparently he knew that if you smacked it by the tip of the tail, they'd let go. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's a, he's a wrangler. I would hope so. It's kind of his job. <laughs> or maybe it was the one of the set guys or something. I heard some story about that, and Steven Spielberg was like, I didn't even know how he knew that. <laughs> oh, that's even funnier. Yeah. And I remember Harrison Ford talking about when the cobra shows up for that close-up when it hoods and it sees his face. Oof. You can kind of see the the glass that they have, like a reflection from it, because that was what was separating Harrison Ford and the Cobra. I did not it? know that. Yeah. yeah. That's usually like an old theater trick, is they use a piece of glass and they separate you, and I think at one point they said that Cobra was really angry, and it did actually spray some venom on the, on the glass, and they thought, all right, certain people have to stand here, stand there. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. It, I thought they would have devenomized that Cobra completely. I thought they would have, too, but they talked about how they had serum hanging around and made sure that people that knew how to inject them were right there. And there was a an actual documentary where Steven Spielberg was talking to the guy about the serum, and they said, oh, yeah, you got to get it in about two minutes. Wow. Or you're dead. Ooh, shit. And I don't know if you guys ever saw it, but uh, I saw what blood looks like after snake venom hits it. It just hardens that's crazy I, yeah i i don't want to say like hard like a it's still like a solid uh liquid substance almost like jello okay so okay it, it's congealing quicker than yeah okay. it, it's actually really wild i think you can just look it up like snake venom mixed with blood and they have it in a little petri dish and it's like seconds man you just see it Yikes. i was like whoa no wonder that's how you die yeah, yeah. not to mention being nowhere near a hospital, <laughs> nowhere near a helicopter, because you don't get anywhere within 10 minutes, you're completely dead <laughs> in something like that. Uh, but just, yeah, just a great sequence. And then, of course, um, you know, them being trapped in the Well of Souls, because once again, Belloc has got to find a way to cheat his way. But at the same time, yes, they found the location from the Well of Souls in the map room, and they were digging overnight. It's a great, you know, sometimes the, uh, 
the special effects are maybe a little bit dated because you can tell it's oh they're very not dated. really a real lightning storm going on behind it. It's cool because it's that eighties lightning. Eighties lightning. It's that fury of God coming back in because they're disturbing something that was not meant to be disturbed, and it's basically like almost like God looking down and saying, "Stop what you're doing. Stop what you're doing. My wrath is coming." <laughs> but Belloc finds a way, as he always does, to. Um, like I said, cheat his way, or not really cheat his way, because they were digging, or they were spending the entire night getting the Ark out of there, and, oh, there's one crew that's working when everybody else is sleeping. What the fuck are they doing? Get the soldiers up there right now! Yeah, so, I'd say he basically cheats his way. Yeah. Well, yeah, he was getting shit-faced with Marion <laughs> after <laughs> any thought she was dead. <laughs> the Nazis took her. <laughs> they take her, and they trap her, and they're Basically led to die. <laughs> Sala, you had to drop the rope twice. <laughs> Sala's a good guy. That was a really funny part, too. Where I love that character. Belloc's just like saying, oh, Indiana Jones, I beat you again. And you just see Harrison Ford there going, ha, 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 you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> These guys have got some bad blood history. Years of bad blood. But great thinking about using that statue of Anubis to basically break down the wall to get out of there and at least find an entry. This leads me to one small, minute issue that I have with it. Yes, while the mummy chamber is really cool, but the dead 3,000-year-old skeletons, they scream. You can hear the screaming sounds when Marion is stumbling into them. You can just hear the sound effects. They wouldn't do that. Me? Oh, whoa. it was because of how loud Marion was screaming. It was echoing off the wall. It was coming through the skeletons. But she would say, Indy, and all of a sudden, she pulled down a mummy, and all of a sudden goes, ah! Well, oh, well, like, may, well, maybe these mummies in this tomb are kind of like a, a seashell when you put it up to your ear and you hear the ocean. Oh, these, my God. They scream. Well, think about it. They, those are the guys that built the chamber. They got killed down there. They're haunting it. Come on. Logic here. I mean, a python did come out of the one's mouth. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah it did. How did. Here's the second thing. How the fuck did all those snakes get down there? They're just hanging out? What's feeding them? Are they eating each other? You didn't think about that? You thought about the screaming skeletons? I thought about the screaming <laughs> skeletons because we're horror aficionados and you don't really hear 3,000 year old mummies scream unless you're watching a horror movie about mummies coming back to life. Well, there's a, there's a combination of horror in with Indiana Jones. Oh, there absolutely though. is. I mean, but that's a, a it's, like a, it's like a really wonderful mix of like action, adventure, uh, biblical, uh, you know, horror comedy you know it's it's got a very well balanced diet of like everything that you need to satisfy i'm just saying genres. like there, there have been some movies where i've seen emaciated dead skeletons start screaming at people like but they're dead they're not living dead that doesn't make any sense to me i feel like at this point in the movie though it fits because you get the idea that the movie isn't super serious okay so it doesn't i i see where you're getting at with it if it was at a different point in time in the movie where we don't understand that yeah there's this fine line between camp and seriousness and how we should think and feel like can we laugh at this point right. you know, like it, i'm saying this is such a minor thing i'm just <laughs> actually I got, I got another uh point to point out okay so if the arc was in that area for that long some of it's going to seep out those guys those skeletons might have actually been alive and then when they, they removed it it was the last bit of life they had left so Ooh, that scream that's... Could have been everything that that was. Okay. All so right. The supernatural aspect of which this movie does have fits that sequence. Okay. All right. So logic. <laughs> logic. <laughs> See, got a loophole. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, luckily, they're not trapped for long because then we get the plane sequence. Now, apparently, George Lucas, uh, not George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, this wasn't originally part of the script. The plane this, wasn't. The plane sequence was not originally part of the script, and he sort of came up with it on the fly. And uh. yeah, <laughs> we'll get to the fly later because there is another fly that will come back into this movie. Everyone knows what I might be talking about, what I might not be talking about, but it, it's it's so simple. But it's like that scene in Jaws where when the shark appears as they're drinking, singing on the boat, and the shark appears, and then all this bad shit is happening. One thing after another after another. The plane sequence. You've got a fight brewing. You've got a big German guy who wants to beat the shit out of Indiana Jones. You've got Marion trapped in the cockpit shooting down the Nazis. You've got explosions. You've got gas leaking. 
one thing after another after another is causing problems for the scene, and they've got to find their way to overcome the situation. You forgot how magnificent that Nazi's mustache was, too. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Fit with that bald head. Exactly. (laughs) But also, some great physical stage work and some good physical fighting going on here, because... When you see Indiana Jones, when he gets punched in the face, the first thing that happens is his knees start to buckle, and then he falls on his falls on his butt. That's the first thing that would happen. If you got hit in the face, your knees would start to buckle. So there was some good detail, some good physical action being done, because Harrison Ford is a physical actor. Oh, hell yeah, he is. He tore his ACL while filming that scene. Mm-hmm. Okay, also, that dude's, what, twice his size? Yeah. <laughs> Tall and wide? Mm-hmm. Yo, so, listen, like- I got hit in the face by somebody much bigger than me, and I know exactly how that feels. And, yeah, you do just kind of go like, uh, your knees are like the first thing to go, and then all of a sudden you find yourself on your butt or you're shaken up completely. <laughs> also kind of like a fight or flight thing. Like, mm-hmm. And if you're not unconscious from a bigger guy, you, you are like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of that blood, and then the Nazi um, gets his well-due... Um, finale his death he gets cut up by the propeller and his blood is thrown across the swastika i mean seriously <laughs> there's blood good bloody shit in this movie <laughs> that is graphic as all hell even if you don't see the propeller you get the idea this guy is cut up into ribbons i mean the sound effect too you could hear him go yeah. <laughs> i liked it when the dude was just there like oh right, come on come on and then he just turns around and ah! <laughs> well even the fact that like harrison ford's under the plane and this plane's uh, spinning because Marion's trying to get out she hits the controls well right? the pilot yeah, he gets right. unconscious and knocks into the controls that's why it's spinning <laughs> and like as it's going around this fight keeps happening like they're fighting on top of the plane uh, around the plane and then finally end up almost in front of it and then he mm. knocks Harrison Ford to the ground and then he's about to like get up and all of a sudden he sees what's happening he kind of like curls so it's like Wow, yeah. he knew what was coming, and that's like, what the fuck? Oh, <laughs> it's such an enthralling moment where you see your main hero just get his ass pummeled, and then he finds just like some strength inside him to just wail back. <laughs> well, doesn't he throw sand in his face to get the upper hand at one point? And oh, he still does. Doesn't even help. <laughs> but he's like, fuck it, I'm just gonna throw some haymakers, and they're all gonna land, and this guy's his face is gonna be blood, and then he just gets hit in the face, and then the propeller happens, and uh, such, and then if you think that scene couldn't be topped you've got the truck chase badass yeah some great stunt work i mean vic armstrong was the stunt man for indiana jones and he just puts his body through hell in that scene he, he was the stunt man for indiana jones and the other movies as well but um very respected stunt man great work and he looks very much so like harrison ford if you see these two together back in their day almost identical I can believe it. Mm-hmm. I also want to say that if anybody were to ever argue that Indiana Jones, the character, is a pussy, just watch the truck scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm-hmm. I mean, just the opening sequence alone proves he's done. <laughs> You've got <laughs> but, him on but horseback. From, <laughs> but from being dragged from the truck, using the whip to hang on, mm-hmm. climbing in the truck, fighting guys, getting shot, throwing guys out of the truck, yep. it was like... Oh, it had everything that was just the fucking ultimate badass, and he he pretty much had to like put his life on the line Absolutely. at that moment because they had the art. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and he couldn't let them do that. And he knows not just for archaeology archaeological purposes, <laughs> but <laughs> but for the sake of humanity. I mean, you've got this moment that's what you call the breaking point, basically where the hero reaches the lowest part of his situation where there's a chance where our hero could die at any moment and if you notice during john williams incredible score indy's on top of shit but once he gets shot in the arm you can tell that the soundtrack that the score has changed it's now becoming more dangerous it's now becoming okay now shit just got real now things are looking bad for our hero because now you've got a guy who gets into the truck pummeling him in the gunshot and throwing him out through the windshield. Yeah, he had to pull himself out of the situation with the whip going underneath the goddamn truck. That is such an incredible stunt being dragged behind it and it's just it makes it all the more satisfying where he beats the shit out of this guy. 
completely. Just several times the face, it's, it's enthralling, and I fucking love it. And then the score that we all love is coming back to full force once that guy gets run over by the truck, and he just bulldozes that Mercedes Benz right into the side of the, the hill. And don't forget, he's riding a horse when he tries to get into the trucks yet. Yeah. That was badass incredible he didn't have to use his gun he just uses his fists and his whip and everything <laughs> but when he does use his gun it is pretty cool though. It, is really, it is really cool because superstitions don't spook indiana jones he doesn't believe in superstition because all he needs in his suitcase is his leather jacket a whip and a six shooter that's all he needs to pack <laughs> and 50 shades of brown right that's what he was like. <laughs> <laughs> that's all he needs and maybe a razor you know, to, to, to shave if he wants to shave, which he does. Doesn't he? He's got, like, permanent stubble. Dude, I don't think they do need to shave it all throughout the movie. Just the same five o'clock shadow from day one. <laughs> <laughs> but there is always something going on in every frame, which is another reason why I love this movie. Somebody I didn't pick up on, that bar scene with interaction between him and Belloc, there's one shot where you have um, one of the henchmen you get a point of view from his back, but you're seeing you're seeing a gun being exchanged from one person to another. So even if a small scene's happening, something dangerous is happening in the foreground, and that's in almost every scene. And then eventually, when Indy recovers the Ark, you get this ominous feel where they're going to load the Ark onto the ship, and you get the introduction to Mr. Katanga. He's smoking a cigarette, and he's kind of by himself, not listening to Sala. Where you think, is this guy good or evil? Is he actually going to be in league with the Nazis? Where, is this going to be more trouble for our hero? So, you've always got something dangerous happening in the foreground. Which is another reason why I love the film. There's always something going on. Suspense. Suspense. Oh my god. Yeah. It, Steven Spielberg was so good at suspense. He was probably like Hitchcock after Hitchcock. Because, I mean, look at the suspense in Jaws. And then when um, Robert Zemeckis did Back to the Future. Which Steven Spielberg had a hand in that. The suspense and the drama in Back to the Future is like, oh my god, man, you're hanging on the edge of your seat so much. So Spielberg's so good at that. Jurassic Park, the suspense oh in that. God, yeah. Shit, dude. They, they just don't make movies like that anymore. Hell no. They don't. No, they make oh. shit. <laughs> That's a whole nother. <laughs> yeah. But there's that, and then there's that great scene between him and Mary, and they're finally together in the boat, and he gets hit in the chin with yeah, the mirror. Yeah, he gets fucking blasted with the mirror. He <laughs> screams. I'm like, I laughed at it every time. Every time. I laugh every time, too. too. And then her reaction, did you say something? Like, I just screamed out loud. You hit me in the chin. <laughs> but he does have one of the best lines when she's talking to him about doing what he's doing and when he's going to stop, and he goes, it's it's not the years, it's the mileage. <laughs> Such a great line. It's true. They think that was an improv line. That was an improv line. You can see all the road rashing on his body from being drugged behind the truck. You, you see all the battle scars that he's had to endure the last couple days. It's oh, it's something. But yeah. They actually have a really like tender moment between him and Marion and that. It's really sweet. And it was. And he, she's like, well, where it doesn't hurt, he starts pointing, and I'm like... Yo, that was fucking smooth. That's really <laughs> clever. That's some good screenwriting right there. That's some good interaction between Karen Allen and Harrison Ford. And that was good chemistry between those two. Mm -hmm. Honestly, that's why I was glad they brought her back later on in the series. and Because she is a popular character. Like you said, she's a, a femme fatale. She's not a damsel in distress. Yeah. Because even when she is, she's not. Come on. In the tent where she's getting shit-faced with uh, Belloc, she's planning to stab the shit out of the guy. Oh, I know. <laughs> But it is a pretty damn funny moment. Like, yeah. two characters are completely hammered, and she shows him a knife. In the Who wouldn't laugh at that if you're completely smashed? You know, and, like, she turns it off, too, like, oh, yeah, I wasn't drunk, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> and then the Nazis show back up. They have to ruin everything. God damn With Nazis. coat hangers. <laughs> that was... Uh, suspense, again. Suspense, yes. You see this thing, and even I remember as a kid going, what the hell is this? It's like, nunchucks? But it's... It's like, oh, it's a pencil thin. And then, yeah, he makes a coat hanger, and I'm like, this is a weird-looking coat hanger. Are you going to strangle these guys? And nope, I'm just going to hang my coat up. And then Listen. on top of them, we're also thinking, why the hell would you carry a portable coat hanger? Listen, up? that guy was a fucking weirdo. Look at he his was, face. He's Look a at weird how he's guy. he's dressed. He's a fucking creepy motherfucker. I don't even know what his name is. I'm glad he got his hand burned. He's a fucking creepy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> he got what he deserved in the end. <laughs> 
<laughs> they all did. <laughs> yeah, they did. Dude, that, I, guy, that would haunt I don't, my nightmares. He does have a general. name. I just don't remember his name. I know he. it was mentioned a couple of times. Listen, and, and Marion actually knew him beforehand because not the first time they interacted because she said his name. Listen, in the his bar. name is now Creepy Fuck because <laughs> the reason she remembered him because you can't forget that face. You know? Or that voice. <laughs> <laughs> I know that actor, they said that he actually had stopped acting before Raiders and was going on to be an acting coach or an agent. And oh, really? Yeah, you know, one of the guys, I don't remember if it was casting agent or Spielberg or Lucas, said they really liked him and some other things and said, why don't we bring him back? And it kind of like resurged his career in a way. I mean, I don't know what else he's been in, really. But I, I don't know either. But yeah, but, he um, he fit that bill perfectly. No, he did. No, he creepy as all hell. <laughs> I mean, you you yeah, it, instantly. I mean, even though the music, you know, added to it, but he was something. No, this is not a good guy. Just the way he sounded, the way he dressed was so different from everybody else. He's wearing like these all black. He's wearing all black clothing out in the desert while everybody else has got their summer attire on, preparing for an Egyptian summer. I mean, good God, this guy is wearing all these heavy layers. How are you not sweating to death right now, Listen, man? Listen, it's 900 fucking degrees, and he's out here in a trench coat and fucking black. What? He's not the bad guy? Yeah. Holding oh. the fireplace poker <laughs> one time? Yeah, he, he knows heat. He knows fire and pain, because that is a moment of fire and pain, sweating to death out in the extreme desert heat. <laughs> <sighs> he's He must be used to it. Um, there is that one scene where he does pat the sweat off of his bald head. <laughs> Fuck's wrong with being bald? Balding. I should say balding head. <laughs> <laughs> he still had some hair. <laughs> oh my gosh. So anyway, back to the tender moment with Marion and Indy. Then all of a sudden, hey, by the way, the Nazis show back up because, you know, they can't fucking end the movie on a high note. <laughs> <laughs> no. Goddamn Nazis. And the fact they're on a U boat is probably the craziest part about this. And they're going to be like, oh, yeah, we'll blow you out of the fucking water and then take the arc anyway. I'm like, God damn, that's something that they around. would do because because um, <laughs> you, you do think that is Katanga bad or is he good? But turns out no, he's he's trying to protect Indiana Jones. Sala, you didn't fuck up, okay? You you did hire somebody reliable to help Indiana Jones and Marion and everybody else. The fact that he was even like kind of standing up for Indy, like, oh yeah, he's not here. We killed him and threw him overboard. I'm like. Hey, we just wanted the girl. Yeah, take your cargo. We just want her because we're men at sea. We don't see women too often. <laughs> and, and then, then the lock shows her back and... up. <laughs> yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. I need her back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there is a moment um, when they do um, dock the submarine where the one German character—I don't know if he has a name—but he's a he's a top guy. Spielberg realized, well, we need to be reminded because. The Nazis are evil for obvious reasons, but they had to add a, a moment or at least a line in the dialogue saying, yes, um, I'm not comfortable with this Jewish ritual that we're about to do because this is something that we don't care for. To basically have Spielberg tell the audience, we need more reasons to hate these guys for obvious reasons. So that's why he wanted to include that line with the guy saying, I don't feel comfortable with this Jewish ritual. And then Belloc is countering it, saying, well, hey, do you want to bring this Ark to Germany and then find that it's nothing? Or would you rather test it to know that it does work and that, okay, we have something to present? But that whole Jewish line, like, yeah, we need to have more reasons to fucking hate these guys. But if there wasn't enough reasons to hate them to begin with... <laughs> Actually, in the same sequence, you kind of get an, uh, a funny scene with Indy, because mm -hmm. he knocks out a Nazi, and then he goes to take his uniform, and he's like, trying to uh, put it on, it's like, a, he's trying to put on a medium when he wears a large type thing, like, the fuck? The child's <laughs> small. <laughs> Good God. And also, listening to some of that German that that one actor was saying, some of it was clear, and then, that's another problem, some of these American actors did not speak German very well. So in the German cut of this movie, they correct all of that because they realize that there's some serious issues with these Americans trying to speak German. It's not really good German. Because I got a few things. I'm like, okay, I think this is what you're saying, but you're trying to say this, but it's not correlating to what you're trying to say. And then, you know what, fuck it, just hit him. Well, they could have just did the Alan Rickman in uh, Die Hard, just make up gibberish that sounded yeah. German. <laughs> I think what he did say was German, though, in, in Die Hard. Like, some of it, yeah, some of it is, and some of it isn't. <laughs> like, I, I thought they said it that the elevator scene, you know, he was just like, I think, 
anyway, we did die hard, so we did die continue. Hard. <laughs> continue. Uh, yeah, I'm like, fuck it, and he just hit him and didn't take his clothes. <laughs> Good stuff. Now, when they get that march to that location and Indiana Jones gets a rocket launcher, or an RPG, if you will, you get a nice scene where you've got negotiating objects. You've basically got Indy. This is the, the you know, hey, you got the MacGuffin, I want the MacGuffin. But before we get to that negotiating tactic that happens, we mentioned a fly. Fly on the wall, or at least <laughs> on the fly. There is a fly that is flying around in one scene where Belloc is talking. And some people swear to this day that Paul Freeman was so good, he carried out the scene when the fly entered his mouth and continued to talk. Because it's one of the most paused moments in the movie where you see a fly in the, scr- in the shot and then it just disappears as it looks like it's going into his mouth. And he still continues to talk. <laughs> I never even Did he that. actually eat the damn fly? Or did he swear that the fly flew away at some random second? It was an editing trick that they got rid of. Because Paul Freeman says, no, I did not eat a fly in that moment. Are you sure about that? It looks like you ate a damn fly and then you carried on with the scene and didn't break. But the fact they used that edit is probably the bigger thing. <laughs> like, hey, this is the best he's Seriously, did. Seriously, <laughs> I implore you all to go back to that scene, look for that fly, and then it goes on his mouth clearly, and then it's gone as it looks like it's going inside his mouth. And he still carries on with the dialogue. <laughs> it's a paused moment. It's the most paused moment in the whole movie. <laughs> but seriously, yeah, you've got you've got a problem. Indiana Jones, he wants the Ark, he wants Marion back, but he also wants to see the contents inside because it's his downfall. This is history. This is an archaeological find for the ages. You want to see it just as much as I do. No, that's a, yeah, that's his thing. I mean, you, I understand it's uh, it, it is that. You got doing the right thing versus what you live for, kind of, Mm -hmm. was what it came down to. Yeah. This is what we got involved with in the beginning. (laughs) That's probably, even in the whole series, like one of the most vulnerable moments of Indiana Jones. It is. Because it was like one one of the only times he ever chose to let his guard down to be like, yeah, he's right. And I mean, I, I didn't think there was any way for him to get away with it. I mean, he was trying, even though it was a little desperate, because he's outmanned. And once he puts down that RPG, he's already surrounded by soldiers. So, ugh, maybe maybe there was a slim chance I could get out of here, but now I realize, shit, <laughs> it's, it's best just to be captured, I guess. Because, yeah, I kind of want to see what's inside. And then you get... The scene. The ceremony. The ceremony. (laughs) Yeah, I know some of those special effects are maybe a little bit dated, but some of them look fucking awesome. Hell yeah, they do. They really do. Especially when those spirits take on an actual form. (laughs) Well, you're missing a major point. They finally, when they're starting their ceremony, they open it up, and Bella gets pissed. So does the other two gentlemen, the creepy fuck, and... uh, (laughs) Because he puts his hands in it, and it's it's just sand. It's just sand. And he, they're all, like, pissed off because they were expecting, like, tablets or something in there, and it's fucking sand. Because, well, then again, you know, Moses destroyed the Ten Commandments, but how badly did he destroy them? That's what I was thinking, that they were just dust. Are they chunks of rock, or are they actual... Is it just dust, like rock, debris, or sand? And it's probably just a trick. The whole thing is a trick because... It's really just the essence of God inside the Ark. There really is no physical form of the Ten Commandments anymore. That's what it kind of feels like, because then you've got the specters, the entities, being unleashed from the Ark. Okay, yeah, so the mummy thing probably does make a little sense now that I'm thinking about it. (laughs) Congratulations, Jeff, you were right this one time. (laughs) (laughs) But honestly, like, that whole sequence, watching that beautiful ghost come out and creepy fuck staring at her and her face just turns into like a skeleton. And I'm like, yo, 
And the music blaring again. Yeah. You're like, yo, shit is going down oh, now. Shit. And you see Indiana Jones yelling at Mary, and whatever you do, just keep your eyes closed. Yeah. Don't, Don't look, look at it. it. <laughs> yeah. And then you get the picture from the book coming to life now. You see that form coming out of the ark and shooting the lightning or the fire, killing all the Nazis. Fucking amazing shit. And then you get the three guys at the head of the ark, get it the worst. <laughs> Larry Moe and Curly. Yo, well, the, the fact that they started melting, and the one guy's like, um, almost like a deflating balloon. Yeah. <laughs> His skull's going in. I'm like, holy fuck. And, like, when you guys said that this is, should have, like, pushed the fucking limit of this movie, yes, it did. They they probably let everything go. Like, they saw this, like, I don't know how to fucking rate this movie right now. <laughs> <laughs> and then just for good measure, you have Hellox, Bellox head exploding in a ball of fire. <laughs> Chunks of meat just flying everywhere, like something that Tom Savini would have been proud of. <laughs> I don't know. I think he probably would have been more proud of like the melting eyeballs and the melting yeah. skin. I was like, that's true. That was a fantastic. <laughs> and, the a- and the MPAA are going, oh, the kids are gonna love this PG. <laughs> yeah. You get Marion and Indy like in a sea of fire, basically, as the arc is just rising to the heavens, and then it just comes crashing down. But you gotta think, the supernatural entities that were in there did a great job of cleaning up after themselves. There was nothing left. It was just there. Oh, no. <laughs> they bless, no mess. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. So, Indy and Marion are sitting there. They're hearing all these screams and this shit fucking happening around them. Are you telling me they didn't peek? Just peek I know, once? right? <laughs> I, what, I, I'd be like, oh, oh. Are, they, are they getting it now? <laughs> but then it's going to find out that you've been looking! Yeah. Die! <laughs> because like, even at one point, you do see a specter kind of come up and around him, like, looking at him, seeing like whether or not they are peeking. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, yo, they even thought about that, yeah. too. <laughs> now, Indy did look for a little bit before he told Marion to don't look at it, shut your eyes, because he could see that there was something coming out of that damn arc. <laughs> He's like, fuck it, don't. He, <laughs> so he did see something. But he didn't see the full force of it. Yeah. <laughs> he saw just enough. And like, no, 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 no. Plus, didn't they say at the beginning that it's the the light, like looking at the light is what was going to kill you anyway? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what gave him the idea to just don't yeah. look at it. Now, I love that there's no scene or sequence showing how they got off the island, how they got back to the capital. I love how it's just a cut from this great wide them looking at the Ark by itself with nothing around it, and it's just the two of them in this gorgeous, beautiful night sky with the stars and everything. It's like the last two minutes, death and agony and screaming and pain and blood and everything is just erased. And now we just get this beautiful moment and then just cut right back to the Capitol. And Porkins, you gotta screw over everything. You gotta be that guy. You gotta be that guy that had to go all in for yourself in Star Wars. And then because of your arrogance, you died in the X-Wing. And now you gotta fuck Indiana Jones with taking the damn Ark to Area 51 and saying it's being looked after by top men. You gotta ruin it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking about this. So, they're the only two on that island. They got a U-boat. So, you're telling me they both carried that arc all the way back to the U-boat and then went to the U.S.? Mm-hmm. Two people. Some things are better just not explained. <laughs> well, like, the U-boat, they could have radioed and said, hey, this is Indiana Jones. They, they could have. I, I got some shit here, man. But yeah. you know what? Some things some are better left here. unexplained. Like, just totally random, but how they captured King Kong. How the fuck did they get him from that Skull Island to New York? We don't care. They just did it. They put him in a boat? The cargo hold? They lug a 100,000-pound gorilla on a boat. Yeah, they do. Just themselves. They they show it. They just drag him over there. Like, 37 people. I don't need to. See, I don't need to see that. I don't need. To, I don't need to see it. It just. We, it just happened. It just happened. So I don't need to see how the fuck they go through all the motions to go to the U boat to get back to the capital. It just happened. Just cut to the fucking capital and the and the pacing. One thing we didn't talk about is the pacing. This movie just keeps moving, and because of moments like that, the movie keeps moving. Perfect. But like I said, Porkins, you got to fucking ruin everything. God damn you, man. Yes, you're a great actor, and you've been in all these incredible movies as these side characters, from Star Wars to Raiders to Batman. (laughs) 
holy crap, I never put that correlation Lieutenant in Lieutenant Eckhart from Batman. <laughs> like, as you said it, my brain just goes, hey, by the way. <laughs> this guy has an incredible resume, and no one really knows that much about him, it feels. <laughs> Dude, I was watching him smoke that pipe, and I'm like, damn, man. <laughs> you seem like you're somebody important. <sighs> <sighs> and he's in government yet. Ugh. I know. Okay, so, Indy's got money, but the situation just fucking sucks. <laughs> It really well, does. he even says it out. He goes, "They're fools. They don't know what they have there." They don't. It's a yeah. it's a it's a character arc where Indiana Jones doesn't believe in the superstitious elements of his of his field. Now he's a believer. Holy shit! Yes, well, this is for real. Saw it. <laughs> I saw it for a brief moment before I shut my damn eyes. And technically, he saw somebody get his heart ripped out <laughs> <laughs> and still live for a little bit. Yeah, and he. And he, he did witness the power of the Shankara Stones, so magic, the supernatural, is pretty real. <laughs> yeah. So if he wasn't a believer then, <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't think, you didn't think about that oh, yeah. one, Lucas. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Spielberg, for letting us know it was Area 51 in the fourth movie, because we had no idea what the hell this hangar bay was with all these crates that look exactly alike. That was an amazing scene, because that just let you know that, you know, the shady, corrupt U.S. government has all this shit mm -hmm. that we probably don't know about. And it's probably true that, oh, mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, you know what? You're right. And then the best part is you see that old guy. With yeah, the little dolly yeah. cart, you know, just like, oh, God, another one. <laughs> <laughs> but now here's the thing that I, I'm wondering about. There was a moment in the cargo ship where we get the shot of the Ark in the box with the swastika insignia on it. And then you see the power of the Ark burning it away. Don't you think that the Ark is just going to do that in the hangar, hangar bay and just burn this mother to the ground? <laughs> Seriously. Well, maybe because they knew the U.S. government's not going to do anything with it, where they, the Ark itself knew the Nazis were going to use it for evil. The Ark is self-aware. Well, it is, because honestly, <laughs> yeah. in um, history, if you touch the side of the Ark, you would die. Mm. So that's why they have to use the pole. So you can't actually physically touch the Ark. You can't. Oh, okay. So That makes sense. I just thought because it was really heavy, they need something to pick now, it up. <laughs> it, it's almost like because of how um, biblical it really is, like holding the tablets it was set that it had to protect itself. So something that big needed to have some protection. Okay, if you, if you touch the Ark, you die. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So knowing that the U.S. government wasn't going to do anything with it, it's just like, cool, I'll stay here. Yeah. Plus Fine. the symbolism of the burning of the swastika on the on the box was burning. Symbolic. Yeah, that's, that's true. This is also true. Good point. They nailed that lid down and then put a padlock on the side. I'm like, what the fuck are you guys going to do? Like, oh, you gotta uh, unlock it. Oh, now I gotta prop the... F Fuck off, man. It's, it's already locked up. Let it alone. <laughs> Old guy probably like, getting paid by the hour. Well, fuck it, man. I'm gonna put every nail in this bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I got three more hours to go. Now, yep. Where am I gonna put this thing? In? This, yep. this mile-long hangar bay. <laughs> Fucking leave it in the middle of the aisle or somewhere. Fuck it, I'm done. Yep. <laughs> up, time's up. Maybe uh. I'll paint... Fragile on it. Fragile. Fragile. Because that guy was like 900 years old, too. Like I know. That's why guy. I was like, oh, there. Got another thing here. He knows all the secrets of Area 51. <laughs> Maybe he's an alien. That would have been an awesome Indiana Jones movie. What, like, the he teamed up with the old guy. And was like, what are the secrets of the Ark? Mm. <laughs> or like, what are the secrets that we don't know about that could yeah. cause global destruction? I know. Well, we got this one thing from China. It's called COVID-19. Oh, God. Uh, oh, bad. God. It's bad. <laughs> but it was unleashed. <laughs> there, there's a, probably a lot of crazy stuff in Area 51. Even, like, showing that that's what that was. I'm like, one of the arcs is actually there. This wasn't <laughs> a fictional movie. Hey, we're always told about those things in movies, like hidden messages that we don't know about or the things that aren't said. Like Skynet. Mm -hmm. When I found out that thing was real. I was There's a like, lot of crazy what? shit out there. I mean, Atlantis, Cowlicks, 99 cent stores. I mean, good God. <laughs> SpongeBob, watch. <laughs> oh, such a damn good movie. And then yeah. that score playing at the very end. I, I, I don't care if there's like no end credits scene. I just want to listen to that song, that theme song, as the credits roll. I just want to listen to it. Good stuff. 
I said movies. Oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm top five. I never get sick and tired of the movie. If anything, whenever it's on, it just even if I don't watch it for a while, it's just a oh man, this movie's so good. Like I said, cell phone off, eyes front, mouth shut. <laughs> That's what happens when I put this movie on, or when it's on television. No matter what part it's on, I don't care. I have to see it from the beginning to end. If it's on television, and it's on midway point, I'll sit down and watch it. Because I have to. I feel the same way. Because honestly, like movie as a whole is a fantastic, but you can pick it up anywhere. You could actually already know what's going on because of mm-hmm. dialogue. Because of like little sequences they do, just be like, oh, by the way. But, yeah, like I would say even... I think the one scene we didn't talk about, which... I, is probably one of the most iconic. We talked about it, a hint, where they hint at it in Temple of Doom. So when they're in Cairo, Marion gets kidnapped by the Nazis. So Indy's trying to figure out where the fuck she's at, and he has to fight their goons. All of a sudden, he gets out into the marketplace, and it splits like the Red Sea. Haha, <laughs> pun. But <laughs> there's a guy literally fucking uh, winging a sword around like a crazy asshole. And all of a sudden, he just goes, fuck it, shoots him with a gun. Mm-hmm. That's probably, like, one of the most iconic scenes. I'm like, we ta- we hinted at it, but never actually talked about it. We never, Yeah, we never fully talked about it, because the whole legend or the myth behind that scene, as we said, we hinted at the idea that there was some food poisoning going around with the crew members. Harrison Ford ate something that didn't settle well with his stomach. And, yes, he was supposed to fight him with a sword. All he could do was just take out his pistol and shoot the guy. And the actor playing the swordsman... Played it perfectly. Damn. When he got shot, his instincts said, just fall to the ground. Just die. And then everybody's cheering around him, and Spielberg saw it and fucking loved it. And said, yes, keep that. I That's still, how it's going to be. I still love the interview with George Lucas, what he said. Harrison Ford was just all like, oh, man, I got a fever. I don't feel like doing this. <laughs> and he goes... Yeah, do a sword fight and learn the choreography. He just says, you know, if this was really me, I'd just shoot him. And that's why they were like, oh, yeah, then then do that. Yeah. <laughs> and the actor, I don't think he knew what was going to happen, but once he saw the gunshot, the, the gun point at him and fired, he just dropped to the ground and died. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know anything about how the other actor... But I love how the reaction of the people behind the dude. They're like, fuck yeah. 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 And the fact that they pick up the sword and they start going, yeah. This motherfucker's dead. I got a free sword. <laughs> free sword. <laughs> you see that thing? Yeah, dude. It was massive. It's like a six foot long fucking like, almost like what? Six inches wide. <laughs> That's a fucking Arabian sickle right there. I mean, good God. <laughs> yeah, like, you see that? Like, the dude picks it up. Like, yeah, I got a fucking free sword. <laughs> I'm going to cherish this. Yeah. I just watched this man get gunned down the street. Fuck it, it's my sword now. <laughs> Tell you the truth, they probably did that. Oh, somebody died? Oh, quick. Take their uh, shit. <laughs> <yeah>. uh. <laughs> I, I'm being serious, too. They probably did do that. Mm. <laughs> but, yeah, like... I was, like I said, I have everything we talked about this movie. That was the one scene I'm like we just we just kind of like skimmed over. It. Like holy fuck, guys! <laughs> <laughs> Probably the most famous scene. <laughs> well, we saved the best for last. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Because I don't have a weak scene in this movie. Everything is my favorite in this damn movie. I don't have a I don't have a distinct favorite because it's all my favorite. Yeah, I, there's really nothing that's bad with it. I mean, if anything, I'd probably say I think maybe the the ending with Marion and Indy being tied to the pole is a little weak, but I, I still think it fits. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that it's usually like every James Bond ending, too. It's like, oh, by the way, I'm going to, you know, half-ass tie you down so you can escape. Mm-hmm. So, hey, there's a James Bond. <laughs> yeah, another one. Da-da-da. But the ropes were burned by the power of God, so <laughs> they didn't untie themselves or use some kind of fancy gadget to get themselves out of the situation. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I, if anything, I'd probably say I'm a little disappointed in the Indiana Jones series because this is what started it and nothing else came after the arc. And I thought it would be really cool to go back to that besides the little cameo of it that came later. But I was thinking, wouldn't it be something if they said that the arc only contained uh, the Ten Commandments when really we know there was 15 and something could... You know, come about that. Sorry, I just thought of the uh, history, history of the world. world. Uh, uh, we got fifteen commandments. Uh, ten. 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 
<laughs> Ten. I mean, it's hard not to think about. Yeah. It. <laughs> Seriously, Seriously, so that's all I went to. <laughs> Especially because of the power that they are contained in the missing, the uh, commandments that gave the laws of life, or mm-hmm. laws to which live. would be kind of a cool sequel, like. Going back to the point of, like, yeah, there's ten in there, but there's five more that have not been recovered. Mm-hmm. So, And what would that do to the Ark if it was actually in there? Or, yeah, oh. as a, like, it was completed as a whole. Yeah. I was thinking, man, that would, that would be something wild. And if they were going to wrap it up, I guess. I mean, but, I don't know what the status of any of the sequels yeah, are. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's um, 900 years old himself. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. But the thing is, like, they began a series... On a high note, so like everything that came after this could not really live up to the Ark of the Covenant because you took all the, literally mm-hmm. the Ten Commandments and God. What the fuck are you gonna come after that? Like, well, oh, oh, we, I know. we got yeah. voodoo and uh, yes, the Shankar stones are not as cool as the Ark, but I, in the Last Crusade, you know, they go back to their roots essentially, but instead of Old Testament, they go to New Testament. Mm-hmm. They go to the Holy Grail, which is. Eternal it's life. Biblical, yeah. That's great. So that, yeah, obviously that was the next best MacGuffin that they came up with in the series. Um, like I said, like if we want to do an episode about the the movie that shall not be named, there's a lot of concepts out there that were far better than what we actually got. There's a book called Tales from Development Hell: The Best Movies Never Made, and there's a whole chapter about that movie and all their ideas. We're better than what we got. <laughs> All of them were I, better. I still remember my cousins telling me a story about how they wanted to make a fourth Indiana Jones movie in the mid '90s, and there was even some like little stink about how Harrison Ford had donated the hat and the coat to I don't know if it was the Smithsonian or some place. It probably was the Smithsonian to tell you the truth. I can't say for sure. Yeah. But. I guess they kind of said, like, at that time when he did that, that meant they really were just done. Wait, wait, so you're telling me they couldn't be like, hey, we can make we're another gonna make one. We're going to make another one, yeah. But yeah. I think that was, like, their symbolism of saying, no, it's not happening. Last Crusade, we're sticking to it, is the Last Crusade. Yeah. But that's Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm-hmm. Great fucking movie. Yeah. Top five, in my, in my top five at least. I also noticed that in one of the teaser posters... It said, from the creators of Star Wars and Jaws comes Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I just thought, just listen to that. Wouldn't that That's like the greatest catch title ever. From the creators of Star Wars and Jaws. Here's a movie for you. But you have to see it. Funny <laughs> thing is, I didn't see Star Wars until after I saw Indy. So Star... I mean, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I was the same way. So oh, Indiana okay. Jones is kind of what got me into Lucas and Spielberg... And it kind of went from there. Like I saw ET after that, and then mm-hmm. so it was kind of cool, like a cool staple point of like a movie that made me. Because from Indiana Jones to Star Wars was a kind of a big thing. Like holy shit! Then starting to discover that actors aren't that character in the movie, obvious reasons. Because yeah. <laughs> now we've got Indiana Jones playing uh, Han Solo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But uh, yeah, like there's a lot. I guess a lot of history, like with this movie. Mm-hmm. And I'm just thinking about, like, yeah, yeah. Like I said, like even though Indiana Jones may not be a real character, as I hinted to, Roy Chapman Andrews was the closest thing we've ever gotten in real life to the real Indiana Jones, a guy who was an archaeologist who worked his way up through the ranks, and he encountered a lot of similar possible fates that happened to Indy in the movies. <laughs> So. And, it, and it's just such a great character to take this heroic figure with archaeology and turn him into a superhero, basically. And he's flawed. You know, he's not perfect. Mm-hmm. He gets his ass kicked, but he keeps on going. So you feel it's kind of like the Bruce uh, Bruce Willis, John McClane, and Die Hard. You feel like he's a normal guy. Mm-hmm. Like the truck scene, that just showed everything that, you know, because Harrison Ford's an in shape guy, but it's not like he's built like Stallone or Arnold. No. no. But no, you know no. he'll kick ass. He's more relatable in that aspect because none of us are, you know, huge muscle building guys. That, that's not who these guys are. Especially you know. during that time, bodybuilding was didn't even exist. But 
you you really got that okay this could be you or me or you know he could take on the big guy get his ass kicked but still find a way to beat him Mm -hmm. and then the the nazi in the truck he looked like an older guy and you're kind of thinking well why isn't he just kicking this dude's ass and it's like because he's a nazi he's a soldier he's well trained yeah you know you, you also see that aspect from that age gap that Mm-hmm. you know kicks in and i was like yeah. man that was so well done like there's so much about it that was well done even believe it or not the silhouettes of indiana jones is so badass and they said that his fedora was different than just a regular uh, fedora it was actually like an australian version i think okay. and that's what gave it a little bit more of a unique look and they said this, so when you saw his hat or the shadow you knew it was indiana jones and not the creepy Nazi Huck or Belloc or somebody <laughs> else that you knew it was him, and he had to look like he'd been around and been doing this stuff for a long time. Mm-hmm. They said when they got the leather jacket, they made it look like it had scrapes and cuts and all sorts that's of detail, shit baby. on that's, it. That's detail. It was supposed to look like he's been around doing this for longer Not, than what we even known about. Nothing's clean or polished. It's that's what makes it great. And. And archaeology in general, because we don't know everything that's out there. There's so much fascinating stuff. And whether it's, you know, from theology to just ancient history, and if you believe in magic, if you believe in curses and all this other weird, wild stuff, it you could go in so many different directions with this character. And it's no wonder they have comic books and have expanded the universe. And then yet we only got three good movies. Three. I'm just saying, we could have a horror movie crossover, too. I'm just saying, he's an archaeologist, discovers Pazuzu's statue. <laughs> <laughs> and then years later, they meet the Ghostbusters. <laughs> oh, my God. See? Just universal, universe building. <laughs> but um, We're here all week. Uh, universe building 101? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> But as you said, Colin, like, because you had an interest in archaeology when you saw this movie, I was the same way. Like, when I saw this movie, I, I thought, hey, that would be a pretty awesome career to have, you know, being able... Because I love world history. Dates, for some reason, just work for me. If I wasn't an actor, I would want to be a history teacher. But then I realized, uh, I think I want to be an actor more often. I think that's a more satisfying career. <laughs> satisfying career. <laughs> no, like what... it, it, has, it has its fun moments, but... Because I realized when I was a kid, like, oh, yeah, archaeology is fun, but there might not be a lot of money involved in that sort of thing. Because even in the movie, Harrison Ford, he's an archaeologist, he's a teacher, but he's also, at times, he needs money. And that's why he's always finding these pieces to sell to the museum so that he can get some revenue to buy plane tickets and to basically do other other things that he needs to do financially, but he can't because he is, he's not rich. I hear what you're saying, but I didn't get that vibe from him. Okay. I felt like he was a guy who did it because he loved it. Hence the scene with the arc where it was like, I can't blow it up. Mm-hmm. You know, he's risking himself with all right. those Nazis, and he's not thinking of money at that point. Well, no, not at that point. At the at first, yes, because he says, I need this I need this amount of money to... I can get that idol again. I just need this. I need this. Here, you can you can you can take these markets. They're good pieces, and the museum buys them as they always do. And he's doing okay financially, but like you said, it's really not about money anymore at that point. When he has the RPG at the Ark, it's it's about history. But I think even when he was going after the idol in the beginning, it was like getting paid was just a bonus. Mm. Yeah, like he, I'm guessing his tenure, so that covered his bills, but he probably had to sell his stuff to do more of these, I would say, missions would be pretty much the best way to explain it. Missions. <laughs> because um, trying to find the idol, and he is finding stuff along the way so he can sell them just so that he could pay for these um, missions, pretty much. Yeah. And that that would be the thing I would see it as. Not that he's like, he needs the money, he just needs it to complete stuff. Where his teaching job is what pays the bills. That's true. Yeah, I feel like if Belloc were to come up to him and say... I'll pay you. I'm trying to do the economics here. Let's just say a million dollars, even though it's not what it was back in that time frame. But let's just say, okay, I'll pay you a million dollars just to go home and let us take care of the ark. You'll be set. 
don't worry about it. Do your other digs and whatever you want to do. But you, I think he turned it down. Absolutely, because of what Belloc represents. Just solely because it's him. It's like, no, 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 you're a competitor and you're a scumbag and I want to make sure that this doesn't happen to you. That you don't get that arc <laughs> because of who you are by reputation and who you work for. <laughs> that's one reason why, I'm, that's multiple reasons why, yeah, I'm not, I'm going to turn down your million dollar offer. <laughs> so. You guys have anything else to add to it? I, don't... I would say, honestly, this movie has stated the test of time that it is still referenced today in, like, new shows and even kids' shows. So, like, my daughter watches the show Bluey, and they Raider, they uh, reference Raiders of the Lost Ark by <laughs> calling it Raiders. And it, literally, the dad rolls a giant ball down the hallway, and they have to run and jump out of the way. Oh, yeah. I was <laughs> laughing about it, because I'm like, as soon as they brought it up, because the little girl's like, can we play Raiders? And she does the theme. Like, the da-da-da-da. I'm like, yeah. no. And then he does it, I'm like, oh, <laughs> So it's like mm -hmm. that they have uh, the video game that's coming out, like which they announced yesterday, which I thought was funny, kind of correlated really? with the fact that we were doing this. I want to look this up now. Um, <laughs> it happened again. Yeah, I know. It happened again. They have the, the Lego games. They have Legos in general. Like they're, they're still making stuff for it. And I'm just saying, this influenced me because I just want to whip the shit out of stuff. <laughs> I, I learned yeah. what a whip was because of Indiana yeah. Jones. And I actually did do a little bit of a whip training. Mm -hmm. Well, especially because my aunt has horses, mm -hmm. so I got to learn a little bit more about a bull whip. Even though you don't really use them with horses a whole lot, but still, I got to do like a little bit of a whip training and nice. stuff like that. I same thing. Wild. I uh, I worked at a Renaissance fair like way back in the day, and a lot of the uh, the artists and and the uh, stunt people they have whips, and so I actually got a chance to try it around a couple times. It's it's a little difficult at first. You just got to get a right feel for it, but it's fun, fascinating. They incorporate in all their shows and their tricks and everything on stage for everybody. It's really fascinating stuff. And I like that they made that into a weapon. That that's like a trade. Like there were so many really cool things with Indiana Jones that are a trademark. Mm -hmm. Like if you're gonna do a costume, you gotta have the brown leather jacket. It has to be brown. You gotta have the whip, the satchel, the revolver. And most importantly, the hat. Yeah. Dude, the hat alone. Not Indiana crazy. Jones without the hat. <laughs> and, I, and I'm a hat guy, and I was like, yo, that's fucking badass. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got a top hat, and the place where I bought it at, they were telling me about how they said they sold replica Dick Tracy and Indiana Jones hats. And I was like, what? <laughs> where can yeah. I get those? <laughs> I mean, where are they? What part of the shop are they? <laughs> 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 It's just I need it. <laughs> it's an amazing character. I mean, my family dog back in the day was named Indy because of Indiana Jones. Which we should mention, George Lucas's dog, a Malamute, was named Indiana. <laughs> That's so no funny. Way. And the dog and his dog Indiana was his co pilot in his car, which was the influence for Chewbacca. Ha ah, dude, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and then of course the dog being Indiana comes back into play later on in the franchise. Oh my god. So, yeah, I, I totally forgot until you brought that up. I mean, hey, my, my old Australian shepherd got rest his soul. I mean, he was named Indiana because of the character. Because he's a big deal. And, like I said, inspired my love of world history and discovering new places to visit one day. Oh, and another thing I also forgot was, originally we are going to call him Indiana Smith. And Steven Spielberg was the one who said, I don't, I love everything about this script except one thing. I don't like the name. And George Lucas was like, well, why don't we just call him Indiana Jones? Like, okay, fine, great. There you go. <laughs> that's a better ring to it. Yeah, it has a lot better ring to it. Kind of flows better. So, and that's another thing. You know, he's got a cool name. He's got great trademarks. I also love the fact that, and it adds to that campiness or like it's on the verge, is that there are times where you think, oh, the hat's gone, it's going to disappear forever but he always gets it back mm -hmm. like that 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 trademark hat uh that's like the and that's indiana to me that's the hat kind of is indiana jones really like there's been teaser posters where all you just do is you see the hat and the whip and you're like oh uh, i know who that is the silhouette the yeah silhouette mm -hmm. and you can't have that silhouette without the hat it's really awesome i always love those trademarks that you can just hint at something. You know, like you could just have a Freddy Claw on a bed and go, oh shit, we're getting another one of these? Bring it on. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
It's so cool. And then, like you said, Jeff, I just can't see anybody other than Harrison Ford playing this guy. No. It, it would just be weird at this point in time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It would. Yeah, it would be. I mean, I know that somebody, like, photoshopped Chris, was it Chris Pratt? Yeah. And yeah. even though he looked like him, I, I just can't, I, I'm sorry, but can't I just get it can't. Out of it. Yeah. No, there there are just some guys that it, it's going to be a hard one to get through. When Heath Ledger was the Joker, I was like, I could see somebody else playing the Joker, though. Mm -hmm. Not to take anything away from Jack Nicholson, but I know because that's going to be different. If you're doing Indiana Jones, maybe even um, John Rambo, you know, I, I can't see, like, you almost have to do something different. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. Heath was a different Joker than Jack. Yeah. But how can you do Indiana Jones differently than Harrison Ford? I mean, you can, but... Yeah. It wouldn't be the same. I, I yeah. understand James Bond because there are so many entries in that franchise. You can't have somebody in their 90s playing James Bond anymore. So it makes sense that they get a different actor every so often few movies. That's one but. of the few franchises where it's worked on a consistent basis. But mm -hmm. each person that came to play James Bond brought something different to it. So, like, Sean Connery being the first, he brought the badassness to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, Roger Moore was more of the smooth talker and... Campiness. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh. I'd say Timothy Dalton was pretty much straight up murder. <laughs> he went back to sort of Sean Connery's roots, but he was more cold-blooded yeah. than Sean Connery. Absolutely. Yeah, he, it, dude was only there for two... Uh, Two entries, and he probably killed more than most of the other. <laughs> I, think I think he's one of the best, Timothy Dalton. So it's like, yeah, like you said, it's one of the few times it works. And but yeah, I'm like trying to think, like, is there any other franchise that they tried to like fill the shoes of somebody else? Like even in Terminator, you always bring back Arnold. That's kind of the thing. Well, look at 2010's Nightmare on Elm Street. <sighs> Ugh. Failed miserably. And Jackie Earl Haley's a talented guy. Oh, he absolutely is. No. But you, you just couldn't do Robert England. Mm -hmm. They gave him too much to talk. They gave him too much freedom with the script, and that was one of the big problems was the script and the director and mostly everything else. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let, let's not end on that, though. Yeah, I was like, good way to end it on a hello <laughs> note there, Johnny. No. <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark, you are incredible. You have stood the test of time. Some of the special effects may be a little dated because it is a 40-plus-year-old movie, but I don't give a shit because the story is incredible. The actors are incredible. Everything. Hero, villain, story structure. All of it is incredible. All of it is badass. And I will continue to watch this movie until my deathbed. So... Yeah, I really don't have anything bad to say about it either. I, don't. I just remember somebody in film school saying that he wasn't impressed with it, and I, it just struck me weird because I just, I mean, I can see kids watching this movie, even despite the spiritual stuff. <laughs> I tell you the truth, because me being me, I was all like, oh, hell yeah, you know, movie magic, makeup, special effects, and scary mm -hmm. things, and biblical things. I was like, this, this is cool shit. <laughs> you know, so I loved it, but when... But I know like what my parents let me experience compared to other people. When I heard, I think it was my brother-in-law's nieces when they were younger, and they said, yeah, did you ever see Raiders of the Lost Ark and their faces melted? And I was like, wait, <laughs> well, what? Your parents let you watch that a minute? Like, I didn't know what his sister and brother-in-law, you know, how they felt about certain movies. But I was like, that's fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> And John and Chrissy are cool people, so I was like, yeah, you're raising them right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Raiders is a go-to. I, I even think Temple of Doom and Last Crusade are easily family-related movies. Mm-hmm. Bring I, people together. I think anybody can really watch them. It's just a shame that the last one that we got just felt like such a downer because they are, the three are just so good. And that it's just a universal thing where any age, any body can really like get into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah. feel like it's not even a comic book character, but no. it's just a well loved and respected. It fits. It really fits. It resonates. It's interesting. You can learn something. You can even 
go back to the movies and go, okay, they talked about this, but is that really true in history? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it makes you think, yeah. and I love that. I love yeah. it when at least something introduces something new to you that maybe you didn't hear in school, or maybe it might even help you learn in school. Like if they talk about you know, some sort of form of history and they say, oh yeah, well, you know, in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, they talked about it in this and it's like, ah, oh, and it helps you click because if you love Raiders, yeah, it's, you know, it's something you can relate to. Exactly. Yes. Um, so let's end it with our favorite team then. It's tough. I know. There's it's, so many. <sighs> I gotta say that it, it, it kind of changes for me because it's like, you know, when they go into the well, you know, I, the very beginning with the idol, like, there's so many great scenes that it's like, it's my favorite this time around, it's my favorite that time around, but one of the most favorite scenes that I think is probably the truck. The truck chase. I, I just thought this, this is like where he solidifies everything about being a badass and the stunt work and how it's do or die at this moment. It was the biggest do or die situation in the movie. Yeah. And I just thought it was the epitome of how awesome Harrison Ford is as his character. Especially the scene where he's being dragged under the truck, and then he uses the whip, and he's just hanging on there. And I was like, oh my god, this is badass. Badass. Yeah, yeah man. And the hat stayed on. <laughs> the, hat, the hat never left his head. <laughs> But yeah, like you said, it's always changing for me. Like one day it's the truck chase scene, one day it's the plane sequence, one day it's the finale. Even sometimes it's the bar sequence in Nepal. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. it's always changing for me. What is my favorite scene? Because I don't really have a distinct one this time. It's all of it. All of it's my favorite. Days, it's changing. Yeah. You know, having this one, the one time I, in, I say it's probably like one of the best scenes is actually showing Indy being very vulnerable is actually on the boat with Marion where he's um, not the total badass that he is, but he just got his head knocked in with the, the mirror and she's like, Oh, they hear anything? <laughs> Did you hear something? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, that was like the one moment. It's like one time moment I could see why they chose to bring her back too, because they actually had chemistry. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it made him vulnerable for once, but the whole time he's like, and every, action hero he he doesn't have vulnerability until that moment so it's like it, i i enjoy that scene so much because of that emotional vulnerability yeah <laughs> yeah i'd say emotional vulnerability definitely there and then uh spiritual vulnerability when it come comes to the rpg with the arc yeah just saying, just hit Belloc with that fucking RPG. <laughs> then the movie. Or <laughs> killing you, everybody. Or you the creepy guy. <laughs> Go kill Go, those guys right there. Yeah. You guys can have the arc for right now. We'll, we'll kill everybody, including Marion, and he's the only survivor. <laughs> oh no, what happened? <laughs> but I wonder what would happen if he did fire that RPG, if he did destroy the arc and it blew up. Like, what would be the effect of that arc being destroyed? The RPG would bounce back. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, would it bounce like... back and hit him? <laughs> would everything just happen according to plan? Everything is exploding and all of a sudden the wrath of God just emerges out of the ark and like, kills him? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> or would it just absorb the RPG and nothing would happen? Wouldn't it be some shit? Especially because Disney does have their hands in Indiana Jones that fucking... They would, like, redo it like George Lucas did with Star Wars, and then the fucking genie from Aladdin pops out and be like, Oi! <laughs> 10,000 years! <laughs> give you such a creak of that. Oh, God. <laughs> you know what? I it. <laughs> I kind of want to see that cut of the movie I know. now. I do now. <laughs> yeah, they're all standing there, and a genie pops out, and I'm like, Yo! <laughs> <laughs> And then he kills the Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when the ghost comes out, and then also just changes the genie. <laughs> what do you wish of me? <laughs> he has the swordsman's sword just like slices through them all. <laughs> and he's like, okay, thank you. Now how do I get out of here? Oh, here's our magic carpet. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> On that note. That'd <laughs> <laughs> be fucking awesome if Robin Williams was still around to do that. Nice suit. What is that? Indian tuxedo? <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Dude, that's, a, that's another movie for another time. <laughs> We're giving um, Hollywood too many ideas right now. 
And they are recorded and copyrighted on this show. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you want them, you got to go through us. Uh, yeah. Disney has some bodies buried. <laughs> I don't know if we have to go that far. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hey, they have their own Area 51 with probably the real arc there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! That's what really happened to Walt Disney. You guys didn't know that? They keep his, they keep hinting about the vault. If you don't get this movie now, it's gonna be locked in the vault forever. Is that the same vault where the Ark is? Yeah. <laughs> no, they store them in the vault so that when you open the disc and you say this movie sucks, it fucking melts your face off. <laughs> <laughs> they know. <laughs> Oh, man, I could stand Captain Marvel. <laughs> Lightning, fire, power of God. <laughs> Tell you the truth, it probably looked more like uh, Tom Atkins' wife in Halloween 3. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, oh, we're taking this kid to the factory. <laughs> more conspiracy shit. Maybe Halloween 3 wasn't bullshit. <laughs> Well, if I'm dead, you know, after this movie gets uploaded, <laughs> you know what you know what I said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shall we? <laughs> yeah. 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 You guys have anything else to add? I'm good. <laughs> All right. So, with that being said, that concludes our episode of Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark, and we're gonna sign off. This is Colin Peters, John Rashader, and Jeff Manfred. Thank you all again for listening. We hope you all enjoy. Stay safe. Stay crazy. Uh, please, somebody help me. Oh, yeah.